Turn to Acts chapter 20. In your devices and your Bibles, we're going to be there today at the beginning of the message. We're going to come back to it towards the end of the message. And I want you to be there on Acts chapter 20 in your devices or on your Bibles because uh, we're going to look for you in this story this morning, Acts chapter 20. I'll give you a second to get there because I really, uh, I really do want you to be there. So Acts chapter 20, we're going to begin reading at verse 7 this morning. On the first day of the week, we gathered with local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. The upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Troas had a lot of followers of Jesus, and you can stay right there, but a lot of the followers of Jesus in Troas were indentured servants, and they couldn't meet during the day, and maybe that's one of the reasons they were meeting that evening where Paul taught and preached until midnight. It also happened to be the last time that Paul was going to be with them on that journey, so maybe it required him to go ahead and teach longer because he had more that he wanted to get through to them, so he continued speaking. And we don't know, were marathon sermons the norm in Troas? How many of you would hang out for a marathon sermon until midnight tonight? Oh, I heard you if it was me. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No, if it were marathon sermons till midnight, we don't know. Did the uh, preaching routinely last for hours on end? We don't know. The scripture doesn't say. But here's what I was reminded of this week as I was studying this passage is that many of Paul's listeners, see, we hear the story about this guy falling asleep, falling out of the window, and falling to his death. And when we hear this story, we miss out that many people understood exactly what was going on. And in this room where this one young man fell asleep and fell out of the window, many of them would have been on the edge of their seat, metaphorically, listening to the good news of Jesus, listening to the teachings of Paul, excited about what God was doing in this world. And no matter how pumped everybody else in the room was to hear what God was doing in other communities and in other places, no matter how excited they were to hear the understanding of scripture that Paul was bringing to them, there was this one young man over in a windowsill who was so tired he couldn't keep his eyes open. He falls asleep. He falls out of the window, splats on the ground, dead. He's dead right there on the ground. Have you ever been in that situation? Not being able to keep your eyes open, especially when you're on an overly familiar drive or you're on a monotonous drive. How many of you have been in the situation where you just, You just, you can hardly, yeah, the drive is so monotonous. Last month, I am 52 years old, and last month for the first time ever in my life, I had something happen to me. Very first time in my life. I'm driving down 71. I call my wife, Mary, and I say, hey, Mary. She said, what? I said, you're never going to believe what just happened to me. Something that's never happened to me before. And she said, what's that? And I said, the rumble strips just woke me up. Literally, one month ago, the rumble strips woke me up. Driving down 71, I was coming back from a district meeting in Mount Vernon, and I'd come down Route 3 and 36 and went across the connector there and got on 71 South. I have driven that since I was 18 years old. I have driven that trip 16,000 times. And on this particular day, I don't even remember being tired. I, I, don't, I don't remember being tired. It's just the drive was monotonous. And the drive got so monotonous on this particular day, not even recognizing that I was tired, I felt that. And then when, when I looked up like this and it set in on me, the rumble strips literally just woke you up for the first time in your life. Boom, adrenaline dump. 
And then I'm driving like this. <laughs> Calling Mary like, you're not going to believe it. The rumble strips just woke me up. Rumble strips just saved me some severe damage. They potentially saved my life or the life of another driver on the road. When the drive was monotonous, when the drive was overly familiar, how do you stay awake or how do you keep a monotonous drive from becoming a dangerous drive? You're either trying to stay awake or the drive is so monotonous, the journey is is so overly familiar to you, what do you do to keep it from becoming dangerous? How do you prevent drifting over the shoulder of the road when you're driving by yourself. You know those shoulder rumble strips? Boom, that's right where I was on that monotonous drive back. It was the shoulder rumble strips on 71. I was, I was about to meet that, uh, uh, the cabling that they do that gives you some give, unlike a guardrail. I was just inches from meeting that cabling and, and whipped it back onto the road, and luckily no one got hurt. But how do you prevent drifting over the shoulder when you're driving alone and the drive is overly monotonous or overly familiar? I'm going to ask you that question in a different way. I don't want you to call out answers. I want to see if you guys can land on my next four slides this morning, on my four rumble strips for how we can prevent from going over the shoulder of the road when our spiritual journey becomes overly familiar or our spiritual journey becomes monotonous, how do we put down some rumble strips on the shoulder side of the road that as we're journeying alone, we can prevent ourselves from going over the shoulder? So I want to see if we can land on that. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand to answer the question, and then we're going to see if we can get through all four of these, if you guys can figure them out for me. So I'm asking about your drive. When you're tired or it's overly monotonous, how do you prevent drifting over the shoulder when the road is monotonous and keep it from becoming dangerous? Someone raise their hand. Tell me what, someone raise your hand and I'll call on you. I want you to tell me what you do. Tanner. Winter, you roll down the windows. If it's winter, you roll down the windows. Okay. Well, we're going to stop right there. I'm going to see, I'm going to see, I got to look at my notes here to see if I can. Uh, work tanners into fitting somewhere. Yes, I can. Let me go ahead and hit that right there. Tanner, you landed on my last one. And yes, I spelled comfortable with a K on purpose, and you'll see why here in a little bit. Intentionally, let me get to that one in my notes because Tanner went out of order. Comfortable. Intentionally make yourself uncomfortable. How do you make yourself uncomfortable to stay awake while driving? Tanner, my first bullet point right here is open the window. How many of you open the window when it's winter out to just try and stay cold? Yeah, all over the room. Uh, How many of you adjust your seat to an awkward position? Uh, uh, Porter, anyone else? You ever do that? It really works well because you're used to riding in the same position all the time. You can raise it up, lower it, scoot forward, move your steering wheel one way or the other, do something to just change up and make yourself uncomfortable from what you're used to. This is, I, I start with the window tanner. My second one, smack myself. How many people in here actually smack yourselves? Okay, smack yourself till it hurts? Me. I mean, there have been times I've been so tired driving, like, man, I got to get there. It's just this much more amount of time. I have left a five-star on my face before, window open, smacking myself in the face, trying to stay awake, trying to stay awake. Because on a spiritual journey that has become monotonous for you or boring to keep from drifting over the, over the shoulder, when you live in a world inside your car of personal preferences, you're going to fall asleep on the journey. When you live in a world of personal preferences, you're going to fall asleep on the journey. So if you do something to make yourself uncomfortable, it helps your mind to be alert. It refocuses your attention because there's nothing like being on that, in that car and the music being just right and the heating and the cooling being just right and your seat's so comfortable. And now some of you guys have seats that blow air conditioning and, and have heat and you can have that, just that back massage heat on and you just, I mean, your head automatically just starts nodding down. And some of us on our faith journey live in a world of personal preferences where we've gotten so comfortable, this monotonous drive. The drive that is exciting has become monotonous and we're about to fall asleep. So do something intentionally to make yourself uncomfortable is one of the shoulder uh, rumble strips that you can lay down. 
people ask me sometimes when they follow me on social media and, and see some of the adventures that I do, and they say, why on earth would you ever do that? You look absolutely miserable. I was in Ecuador climbing to 20,000 feet on a mountaineering trip, and it is the most miserable that I've ever been on a mountaineering trip climbing to 20,000 feet. I had a little bit of altitude sickness. I'm on the side of a mountain sitting on an ice axe trying to stay awake from the altitude sickness. I was completely uncomfortable. I was absolutely miserable. On the, when I finally got back down two days later, I, I was sick from the altitude sickness from the journey. I was absolutely miserable the whole time. And people say to me as I'm telling them the story, why in the world would you do that? And the answer is very simple. If you're willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations, you get to see exciting things that no one else gets to see. When you put yourself in uncomfortable situations, you get to experience things. Even if we just go backpacking for a couple days and people are like, oh, I don't want to be outside. Uh, Kayla Hamilton's the worst about this. She's like, I don't want to be outside. I don't want to go camping. That sounds terrible. That sounds horrible. I'd never do that in a million years. And I just tell people when you get back from a backpacking trip, which is a lot of fun, but you're miserable a lot of the time, your couch never feels as good as it does when you get back from a miserable trip. That when you leave your comfort zone, your personal preferences, when you get outside of those, that world of personal preferences, and then you're back in your world of per personal preferences, you appreciate it so much more. So share your faith in more challenging situations. That's a rumble strip you can lay down. Where have you shared your testimony of what God's done in your life in the last four weeks? Where have you shared it? We'll share it someplace different. Share it someplace that in the last four weeks you weren't willing to share it. And if you do that, you're going to find, it's going to make you uncomfortable because it's outside of your personal preference of someone just inviting it or just straight out asking you about it. But if you share your faith in a place that you haven't shared it in the last month, it's a rumble strip that you can lay down and say, I don't want the drive of my spiritual journey to become monotonous. Care front someone, as I preached about three or four weeks ago. A lot of you told me how much you appreciated that message and how much you needed it. Well, I tell you what, if you actually follow through on care fronting someone, you're going to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation, but it's going to be a rumble strip you need in your life. As Kelly Rush taught us for the last couple weeks on money, give extravagantly. Many of you are in the habit of your faith journey of giving a certain amount, 2% or 3% or this here or that there, or giving to this or sponsoring that child, and you're doing the same thing now that you were doing five years ago, that you're living in your personal comfort zone. Find a way and a reason to give extravagantly, and that will help you. Let's do another one. Someone else had their hand up over here. Uh, Amy. Blair music is another way you keep awake. Let's, let me look at my notes here and see which one we can uh, squeeze that one into. Blair music. I would say that would be in the same category, making you uncomfortable. Someone else. I call, my wife. call your wife. Yes, you nailed another one. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. Have a meaningful conversation. Have a meaningful conversation. The connection here, let me find it in my notes because he's out of order also. I wish you guys wrote like I write. It'd make this easier. <laughs> yeah. If you're lonely and the journey's become monotonous, have a meaningful conversation beginning with God. Ephesians 6, 18 and 19, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere and pray for me too. To have a meaningful conversation with God. And in your relationship, to pick up the phone and have a meaningful conversation with someone else. As the band was having our pre-meeting this morning, before the worship gathering began and after practice. I was thinking about this, and, and one of the things that, that we encourage our team to do is because when you get up here each Sunday, a lot of the routine is the same of getting your instrument on and putting your in-ears in and making sure your sheet music's ready and all that. I said, get up here early and be ready, and as you see people coming in, just pray for them. Pray for what, how the Holy Spirit would impact their life today. Pray that the Holy Spirit would have a change on them. Have a meaningful conversation. Let's do another one. Amanda. Eat or drink something. I got to look at my notes here to see where I can, what box I can squeeze that into. Uh, eat or drink something. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put I'm gonna say that one's with do do something exciting uh, like the first one, and and I put that with did I do this one yet? Oh man, see I messed up. Let's go with it. Let's go with it. I like it. You're, you're writing well this morning. Let's see here. Do something exciting. Caffeine and sugar. On a monotonous drive back in the day, Fat Greg would stop at the gas station and get a large bottle of Mountain Dew, or I preferred the Fountain Mountain Dews in like a 40 ounce. I'd get a 40 ounce, but it'd be Mountain Dew. And, uh, and a giant bag of Reese Pieces. Mountain Dew and Reese Pieces, man, that would keep me awake for days on end because it gets your blood pumping. It gets your mind alert. It gives you something to do, something to think about, something to focus on, and, and caffeine and sugar would do that for me. And are the spiritually exciting stories distant from your past? This is a question that Nate Porter, uh, he, didn't, uh, he and I were having a conversation five or six years ago, and he pointed out something, that someone that we were talking about, I don't even remember who it was, but we've had this conversation 50 times since then, is that you'll be in a meeting with someone or a prayer gathering or a group or standing in the in the grocery store talking to someone and they will tell you about some awesome story that God did and then you realize that was 17 years ago and you ask them about another story of of something that God did and that one was 12 years ago so Nate Porter poses the question to people yeah I'm still in your material Nate Porter poses poses the the question to people are your spiritually exciting stories about God from the distant past or are they from the recent present? You see, when your faith journey gets monotonous to the point you may fall asleep, then do something exciting. Make your stories about God from the recent times. Yes, I can tell you about awesome stories from when I was 20 years old and led one of my friends to Christ. I can tell you awesome stories about what God did for me and my family when I was 27 years old. I can tell you stories about starting this church 20 years ago. But that's not what gets us interested or exciting. That's not what keeps this from being monotonous. What keeps it from being monotonous is watching what God is doing through the, e uh, the ESL team and Katie Bach in this ministry growing so rapidly when last year was such, a, was such a struggle to get one person to be a part of it. And now it's growing rapidly. I like telling those stories because they were happening on Thursday night. And they're not from the distant past. John 14, 12 through 14 says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works than these because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, meaning that it's in God's will, and I will do it so the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You can do something spiritually exciting that you haven't been doing for the last year or two years or three years or four years or five years. Do something spiritually exciting. We're working on a couple new worship songs, and one of the things that we do is spend some time reading through the lyrics of them and, and double-checking the theology and seeing if it fits into a well-rounded theology with the other 30 or 40 songs that we're doing in a set. And one of the songs that we're going to be learning in the next couple months has some theology in it that's built around this, that Christ gave the disciples the authority to do the same things that he did. He commanded them to go in the world, preach and teach the gospel, that he's given us the authority to do his work in this world and speak on his behalf. And we're going to do the song because it will produce something exciting in our lives. It will remind us, you're not here to just attend from week to week. God has you in this world. He's given you the authority to do work in his name, to see lives changed to do miracles, to speak healing into people's lives and hearts and minds. He's given you the authority to do it. Powerful, powerful stuff. Do something spiritually exciting. All right, we got one more. We, we have three of them, right? You know, the only thing I'm missing in this message is being able to keep track of what we've done already. I should have had me a little note card or something up here. Wait, let me see which one we're missing first. Oh, yeah, I, I knew this one would be the one we're missing. Let's see if we can even... You guys are going to have to work hard to get, to get this one down, but it's one of the most significant ones. 
Du, 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 du. So we got do something exciting, have a meaningful conversation, intentionally make yourself uncomfortable. We got one more this morning. So Jim Cate, change of direction. That's a good one, but I don't want anything to do with that one. It doesn't fit in my sermon. Uh, another one? Someone's going to have a tough time getting this, John. Get off the road. Man, we're getting close. There is something that statistically, it might change in the future with the proliferation of phones, but still to this date, statistically, there is a more distracted driving than your phone. Any of you guess what it is? There's something more that is more of a distracted driving. My data might be four or five years old, but there's something more distracting, equally distracting as messing with your phone. Cole, were you going to guess at something? Oh, uh, you put your hand up. Put your hand back down, boy. <laughs> Nate. Kids in, the back of the car. kids in the back of the car. Okay, we're getting close. When kids are in the back of the car, what is the distraction? Because, because where we're going is not kids in the back of the car, but what it does to the parent internally is where we're going. What's the problem with kids in the back of the car? Noise, noise okay, and what's the noise do for you? Wait, wait, what? <laughs> Irritates you. Yes, yes, we've landed on it. Uh, let me find my slides here. I don't have my reading glasses on. <laughs> Boom. Angry. Emotionally distracted. Develop emotional maturity. The underlying tension when you are in a car by yourself, the underlying tension of your emotional life when you are on your spiritual journey, one of the most dangerous things to you going off the shoulder of the road when you're traveling with Jesus is not being emotionally mature. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something to you straight from a law firm's website. As the VTTI researchers found, allowing your emotions to get the better of you when behind the wheel can be a highly dangerous form of distracted driving and increase your risk of getting into a car accident nearly tenfold. When your emotions are boiling, bubbling, or where the focus of your heart and mind are, you are ten times more distracted driving. The same is true on your faith journey. When your emotions are driving your faith journey, you're at risk of going off the shoulder. I continue with the, with the law firm website. When you get into the car, you take your emotions with you. You may be upset or stressed out about something that happened at work. You may be angry about a driver who cut you off or is driving too slowly. Anyone get angry when a driver cuts you off or they're driving too slow? Okay, don't raise your hands. You could also be sad crying or depressed about a relationship, 10 times more likely, 10 times more distracted when you're driving that way. So why did I find this on 100 law firms' websites? Even though you may, be, even though you may take all the steps to drive safely and avoid risky behavior behind the wheel, you too can be the victim of an angry driver. If you have been in an accident through no fault of your own, get in touch with the Kindle Law Firm. We, have thoroughly, we, we can thoroughly investigate your case, including looking into the possibility, uh, looking into the possible role of an angry driver. We can also aggressively pursue just compensation for you. That's why it's on law firm websites. But James said it a long time ago in 120, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. When we think about the fruit of the Spirit, one of the things we often don't pay attention to, that the fruit of the Spirit align with emotional maturity. Love, joy. Joy is an emotional space. Peace, an emotional space. Yes, it plays into our heart and our minds and they work together. Patience is an emotional space. Kindness, generosity, how many of you struggle with being kind when your emotions are out of whack? Generosity, you're angry, sad, mad. You don't feel as generous in spirit or in giving either one. Faithfulness, you don't feel like being faithful when your emotions are going haywire. Gentleness, you definitely don't feel like being gentle. Self-control, self-control, absolutely not. That the fruit of the Spirit what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life is producing emotional maturity. 
through your faith maturity. And one of the reasons that he's doing that is because the road will never be monotonous. The journey will never be monotonous when you have these rumble strips there. So the reason I spelled it wrong is I am horrible at acrostic sermons. And I wanted it to work. So we're spelling comfortable with a K. And I hope it helps you remember it. The rumble strips as the band comes that you can put on the left shoulder of the road or the right shoulder of the road to prevent you when you're traveling alone and your faith journey has become monotonous. Lay down these rumble strips. Let's jump back to Acts chapter 20, verses 10 through 12. You got your Bibles and devices back open? I told you we were coming back to it. Acts chapter 20. Verse 10. Let's pick up where we left off before we start reading. We stopped at verse 9. We're out on the street looking at the outside of the building. We're looking at the body of a young man who has just fallen three stories onto a stone sidewalk. He had just fallen asleep during a sermon and proceeded to fall to his death. And we pick up in verse 10. Paul went down, bent over his dead body, bent over him and took him into his arms and said, don't worry. He said, he's alive. Then they all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, and ate together. Paul continued talking until dawn the next morning. You see, that's out of excitement. They just saw a miracle happen. And well, uh, it talk, uh, uh, da, 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 da. Paul continued talking to him until dawn, and then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. You think that young man will fall asleep again? <laughs> you think he'll sit someplace different? You think he'll make himself uncomfortable? The Apostle Paul's journey was exciting. Now those who were following the Apostle Paul, their journey just got super exciting. Not only did they get to hear him teach and learn more about who Jesus Christ was, but they got to participate and be a part of a miracle that God did in someone's life. And in that room where Paul was preaching, God was moving. A foundation would be laid that would change the world and change your personal world in that room that day. And those who were following the Apostle Paul and following Jesus were able to be a part of that exciting journey. It had not become monotonous for them. It had not become dangerous because it was overly familiar. In that room where Paul was preaching, God was moving. Many people would have been on the edge of their seats anticipating and experiencing an exciting journey. But this young man was in the same room. He is in the same room where the foundation of the church is being laid through the work and ministry of the disciples. And they know exciting stuff's going on. And this young man is in the same room, on the same journey, but it has become overly familiar to him. It's become monotonous to him. And he's falling asleep while he's right in the middle of it. In that room where Paul was moving, God was moving. Or where Paul was preaching, God was moving. So my question to close this morning is, which one represents you best today on your spiritual journey on your spiritual journey are you on the front of your seat even if what's going on around you is familiar it's not overly familiar because you make yourself uncomfortable you're developing emotional maturity you're having conversations with God and conversations with others that are meaningful and not just not just platitudes and emptiness and are you doing something spiritually exciting those participating in ministries around here, although the routine of it, just like playing in the worship band, the routine of it, we never want to lose the excitement of it. The routine of ESL, the routine of serving in the nursery, there's a routine of serving in children's church. God is doing something in people's lives around us that you get to be a part of, and it is exciting. Which one are you today? Has the Holy Spirit showed you that you're the young man sitting in the windowsill that has become too comfortable? 
Or maybe you're just diving into your loneliness. Maybe you're diving into your, uh, your emotional immaturity. Maybe you're diving into your tiredness and the Holy Spirit shaking you today and say, hey, you're on the same journey everyone is in faith. And it's exciting. And you have the power to do the things that Jesus was doing. He wants to use your life that way. Man, I love this. Let's stand and pray for you today. I want to pray first for those of you who might, the Holy Spirit might be tapping you a little bit on the shoulder and saying, you know what? You see it. Maybe not in all areas of your faith, but you see where you're starting to fall asleep on the journey that is an exciting journey. But you need to lay some of these rumble strips out there. You need to lay some of these rumble strips out there. I want, would you go ahead and put that slide back up on the screen for me? Because I want to, I want to pray that way. And I want you to, uh, you, you can bow your head, you can close your eyes to pray if you want. You don't have to. If, if that's you, if that slide will help you looking at that, you can pray that way. You can just look at that slide and say, God, I have been diving into my loneliness. And the journey's got monotonous and boring. I, I, I don't want that for me. I want to have meaningful conversations so as we stand here during prayer. And we're just going to go ahead and begin praying right now. God, as I stand here in prayer and I'm looking at that loneliness, I, 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 I want you to help me to step out and have meaningful conversations with people. God, I'm tired. It's been a hard year. Been difficult with the family. Been difficult to just keep working through this ministry that just seeds are being planted, but I don't see anything growing. God, I'm kind of getting tired of it. I'm about, I'm about wet, ready to withdraw. Thank you for showing me today that it's become overly familiar because I'm not doing anything exciting. I'm not doing anything spiritually exciting. I'm not giving extravagantly. I'm not sharing my faith in the lives of people who desperately need to hear what Jesus is doing from me. God, help me do something spiritually exciting. God, I've become too comfortable. I've become too comfortable. I like the way my church does this and my church does that. And and I've just gotten so comfortable in my morning routine. I've gotten so comfortable of going into my school and never saying anything about my faith. I've gotten so comfortable with that. I've gotten so comfortable with going into my workplace and and never talking to anyone about what Jesus has done for me. God, I don't want to fall asleep on the road of faith with you today. Amen. 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 Holy Spirit will permanently move and change lives. You know the direction of people's lives are completely changed. And look at me up here this moment. Directions of people's lives are, are completely changed when the gospel is preached and in our own free will, we respond to it. There are people in this room and people online who will do something spiritually exciting they would not have done if the Holy Spirit had not challenged them with this teaching and lives will be changed. There will be people who will commit to developing the fruit of the Spirit and develop emotional maturity because they want the road to be more exciting for them. There will be people who will have meaningful conversations and intentionally do things to make them uh, uncomfortable because of the preaching of the word, and you get to be a part of it. You get to be a part of it, and that's exciting. God, we ask that you would do that for us as a room. We want the work that you're doing through New Start to be the most exciting thing that's going on in any New Starter's life. We want it to be the work that you're doing in the lives of the people who are sitting around, the people who are watching us online. We want to see lives transformed with the gospel, and we thank you for what you're doing through us. Amen? Amen. Let's worship together, and then Morgan's going to close us.